Jordan Chachoua, bonjour. Good morning. Vous êtes le cofondateur de Mobileye, une start-up israélienne spécialisée dans l'assistance et la conduite autonome que vous avez vendu à Intel en 2017, 15 milliards de dollars. C'est le plus gros exit de l'histoire d'Israël. Cette entreprise que vous continuez de diriger en tant que PDG vient tout juste de faire son entrée en bourse. Elle a été valorisée à 17 milliards de dollars hein, dès euh, son entrée en bourse. Au-delà de ces chiffres hein, qui donnent le vertige, il y a une intuition très tôt de votre part du euh, potentiel euh, que peut avoir la vision artificielle. Euh, vous voulez en fait remplacer euh, les yeux euh, des hommes ou bien euh, doter en fait euh, les machines comme les voitures euh, de vision, c'est ça Today we are equal 27 billion. So we went for an IPO at 17, now it's 27 a month and a half later. Um, so Mobileye was founded 23 years ago. So 23 years ago, we didn't have the vision of autonomous cars. We had a different vision, and that vision is to equip every car with a driving assist uh, system, which is low cost enough, but very effective, with, with, with ability to, uh, to save lives. Now, back in 1999, when we were founded, when we started the company, there was no camera technology in cars. Uh, the idea was that there are radars, very expensive uh, radars, but no camera technology because no one believed that with the cameras, you can reach the kind of safety levels and, and the robustness levels that is required for a product that works for many, many years without, without failures. And the car industry were, were playing with the idea of putting a stereo camera. Just like humans, they we have two eyes to put a stereo a camera, which would be expensive because you have a number of uh, cameras. And, and we came up with the idea that it is, and that's based on science, that it's possible to do it only with a single camera. And when, when I explained this to our customers, to you know, automotive uh, car makers, they, they brushed it off as something that would never work. I would say, you know, there is a reason why humans have two eyes, it will be more robust, you know, you're, you're thinking of one camera, it will never be robust enough. And no matter how much I explained that it's actually opposite, you know, that people use two eyes only for short range, the stereo is only for short range distances. It's, most of the processing in the brain is monocular, just, but no one, no one believed that it will work. It took us eight years To, uh, to start deploying the first single camera system in cars. It was with, uh, at first it was with Volvo and then GA, General Motors and then uh, BMW. Today we are working with 50 car makers. We are about 70, 70% of the global uh, market. Every, in, in 2021, 50% of new cars came with a front facing camera. 70% of it was, was Mobileye. And I think Mobileye changed the industry. What people thought was not possible, to have a single camera that would be able to save lives, now it's standard. And uh, the projection is that by 2025, 75% of all new cars would have a front-facing uh, front camera. And what that front-facing camera does, it detects vehicles, detects pedestrians, detects lane marks, traffic lights, traffic signs, and provides signals to the car control system to avoid accidents. So that, that was the vision. And, and we, we uh, kind of envisioned to ourselves that every car would have a front-facing camera because the cost would be very low and the robustness would be very, very high, and we succeeded, really. Then in 2012, there was a big change in science, the change of deep networks. And we understood that with deep networks, we can do much more than the classical machine learning that we were using uh, at the time. And we gradually developed a new vision And that new vision is that we can equip a car with 360 degree kind of awareness, use deep networks and the emerging, you know, uh, uh, the re-emergence of artificial intelligence, and take this one level up. And one level up is have the car drive for you, rather than, you know, the, you, driving, uh, you driving the car. That would reduce accidents even uh, further. It could change the way we think about transportation. Um, you know, from robot taxis to, uh, to getting back your time. So if you buy a car and that car has, you know, legal autonomous, say only for highways. Say you are told that when you go into a highway, you can, you can read a book, you can go to sleep. When you finish the highway, take back uh, control. 
it gives back a lot of time. So we started with safety, and now we are kind of merging into changing transportation in terms of making you know, a, a mobility much more affordable because there's no driver in the car, and also giving back time to drivers because you are in a car that you purchased, and for a kind of 90% of your driving, you can legally read a book, go to sleep, and the car would manage it on, the, on its own and very, very safely. And this is, we started to build that vision in, in 2012. Um, in 2017, 18, you know, it got accelerated much more. And uh, now we are at the, at the stage in which we are about to release our robo taxi. Uh, and also in 2025, 2026, we have a number of contracts with car makers to introduce autonomy for uh, consumer cars. So you buy a car, and then in certain types of roads, you can detach, legally detach, and the car would give you back your time. Oui, il y a beaucoup de, maintenant de euh, concurrents hein, dans, dans ce marché. On pense à Google, Tesla par exemple. Euh, il va y avoir une concurrence féroce entre, entre tous ces acteurs. So, so we, 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 are, we are different from you know, other, other actors in this. Uh, yeah, so one difference, if, we com if you compare it to robotaxi companies like Waymo and, and, and Cruise, they're focusing on a very narrow aspect, which is only autonomy. Mobilize focused on the entire spectrum, from driving assist up to autonomy, and, and we have a kind of a methodology of how the low level influences the high level and how the high level influences the low level. So for example, we, we, we see the kind of value nodes going from just a front-facing camera in a car, this is what driving assist is today, to 360 degree kind of 11 cameras around the car, uh, which provides an eyes on, the, car, the driver is responsible, but the car can drive on its own everywhere. Highways, urban, arterial, everywhere. And we launched this kind of product, we call it Supervision, in China first. There are about 60,000 cars in China in a brand of Geely called the Zeker that is equipped with mobilized 11 cameras. And you can drive hands-free but still, you are responsible. We call this eyes on, hands free everywhere. We use that as a building block, as a basic building block for now adding redundant sensors, add the lidar or other radars, and then you can uh, then you can create an eyes off autonomy. And we have, and this is kind of a modular. Rather than going what, immediately to autonomy, it goes by step by step. You start with the supervision, 11 cameras around the car, and then you start adding sensors. And depending on the type of sensors and their placement, you can start giving autonomy on certain type of roads. So you can you start with only highways, then you add arterial, then you add the uh, urban. And we have now contracts with car makers that from starting from 2026, highway autonomy would be something that you can purchase. You buy a car, and on all highways you have full autonomy, eyes off uh, autonomy. And this is based on this modular approach that Mobileye has been uh, building. Another difference is that Mobileye is a profitable company. Mobileye uh, went for its first IPO back in 2014. And since 2014, Mobileye is uh, profitable and, and with, with a very significant gross margin, profitable uh, margin, profit margin. Uh, last year, 2021, out of $1.4 billion uh, revenue, we had about $500 million of profit. So, so it's a very profitable company. It's important because it allows sustainability. Because when you think about autonomy, it's really a long range game. It's a long game. It, it will take another decade at least for this to become ubiquitous, for this to become say 10% of all cars have, uh, have autonomy. So you need to continue making big investments. And if you don't have a money generating machine, then at some point you cannot continue bleeding money. And we see that with other companies like Argo AI that you know, closed, sh shut down. And, and this makes Mobileye very unique. We can sustain very, very long time, very big investments in bringing this autonomy uh, to life. Vous nous avez euh, décrit euh, tous euh, les, les avancées de la voiture autonome, mais euh, quand est-ce que les citoyens lambda vont pouvoir bénéficier de ce transport intelligent ou de cette ville intelligente aujourd'hui On est dans des villes complètement congestionnées euh, avec énormément euh, d'embouteillages, que ce soit à Tel Aviv ou dans d'autres dans villes dans le monde. Uh, 
Uh, one future is robotaxi. So the future of robotaxi is that you know you remove the driver from the equation and you start uh, creating mobility, kind of a ride hailing, a ride sharing, it's like taxis but without uh, without a driver. Why it's important to re to remove the driver? The cost goes down. The calculation of the cost is that you can uh, bring the cost per mile lower than the cost of a bus. And you know, public transportation is subsidized in, in everywhere in the world. But you can create a profitable mod model because you remove the driver. Now what this would create eventually is that all mobility can be served by these robotaxis. Uh, cities at some point, starting with the big cities, would not allow private cars or, or manually driven cars to enter the city because all mobility would be provided by autonomous cars. Autonomous cars are much more efficient. Utilization is much, much higher because you're talking about a fleet of cars. So the number of cars on the road would go down dramatically. So some studies show, for example, if you look at San Francisco, there are about 60,000 ride-hailing cars, Uber, Lyft. Studies show that if you have a fleet that is optimized, you can serve the same demand with 2,000 robotaxis. So the number of cars would go down dramatically, and then this would spread from city to city, city to city. And then the incentive of owning a car would go down considerably, and you'll own a car just for, for sports. So this is one future. Second future is kind of the, this incremental evolution of driving assist. It's an option that you buy when you buy a new car. So you buy a new car and you have an option, say $10,000, $15,000, to buy an autonomy package limited to a certain type of roads. So let's, let's assume that's only highways. So whenever you go on a highway, you press a button and then you can relax legally. You don't need to pay attention, your eyes are off. And then the value is you start getting your time back. Right. So these are the two possible futures, and, and Mobilei is working on, the, on, on both futures. Alors, quand est-ce qu'on va pouvoir voir dans les rues de Tel Aviv ou de Munich ces fameux uh, robotaxi? So, so the schedule, if you look at both Mobilei's plans and also competitors like Waymo, Cruise, today the issue is not technology. Today the issue is scale. How do you create a business out of it? And you start seeing, you know, a small number of cities small number of uh, you know, small fleet sizes, uh, start experimenting with uh, creating mobility as, as a service. And this would ramp up slowly. For example, Mobileye is, uh, we have partners in Europe where next year in 2023, in a number of cities, a number of uh, European cities and also in, in, in Israel, we would deploy somewhere between 100 and 150 vehicles, kind of POCs kind of uh, um, creating experiments of trying to see the business aspect of it. You know, what is attraction? What is the interest of people to go into an autonomous car? With, uh, with some partnerships, we see the scale coming in 2025. With some partners, we see that about 10,000 vehicles in 2025. Uh, projections are the end of the decade would be hundreds of thousands of uh, robotaxi vehicles. So this is robotaxi. In terms of the consumer, it starts 2025, 2026. So we have a number of contracts with car makers that in 2026 time frame, you can buy a car and get autonomy on highways. Uh, so I think from now till the end of the decade is the ramp up, both in robotaxis, which would be a slow ramp up, and with consumers starting in 2026, a, a fast ramp up because it's production vehicles. Um, and by the end of the decade, our projection is that 10% of all new cars would have a, 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 a autonomy feature. L'autre système de vision embarquée que vous avez développé, c'est Orcam. Cette fois-ci, pour des personnes malvoyantes ou aveugles, hein, c'est un dispositif avec une caméra, ça se clipse comme ça sur les lunettes et ça permet de transmettre oralement un texte, une information sur l'environnement. Comment est-ce que vous avez eu l'idée de créer cet outil So Orcam today is, is more than blind people. So the idea of Orcam was in the camera in the car is performing artificial intelligence, understanding the surrounding and making decisions. We told ourselves, well, what happened if the camera is on me? If I have a camera on me, how, how could it help me? So the camera would understand the world and tell me about the world. How can it help me? And then we told ourselves, you know, the first segment of society 
that can benefit is blind and visually impaired. The camera will understand what's out there. You know, whether I'm opening a newspaper, it understands it's a newspaper. I can communicate with the camera by talking to it. I can tell the camera, you know, read me the headlines, and then I'll, then I'll tell, okay, stop, read me article number three. Or I can look at you and the camera will tell me your name. Or I can look at an object, the camera will tell me what object it is. Or the camera can memorize a path, a route, and take me through that route. Say so I'm going into an office building and I want to go to your office. Uh, the camera you know, recognizes the route and simply will tell me, take a left, take a right, and help me as, as someone who is who's blind and visually impaired. Then we started, next, next layer was dyslectic. You know, people who have reading disabilities. The camera can help me first read me the text, but also give me feedback on my reading. So the camera knows what the text is, it listens to me, and then it gives me feedback about the pace of my reading, what words I, I, I had difficulty uh, with, and give me feedback so that I can improve my, uh, uh, my reading. The camera can also use the latest natural language understanding and play a game of question and answering. So to help me kind of uh, do reading comprehension. So I'm a child, I have dyslectic, I have reading disabilities. It's not only I want the camera to read me the text, I would like to get feedback on my reading and then practice my reading comprehension. So the camera would ask me questions, I will answer the questions, the camera would give me feedback whether my answer was correct or not correct based, based on, on, on the text. So this is another segment of society. A third segment of society that we are now working on releasing by the end of 2023 is uh, hearing disabilities. One of the major problems of uh, hearing disabilities is being able to have a discussion under noisy conditions. So noisy conditions is not only background noise, it's other people talking. So for example, while, while I'm talking with you, there are other people talking. So when I have good hearing, my brain can kind of filter out all those other people and focus only on our discussion. When I have hearing disabilities, the brain cannot do that. And a hearing aid also cannot do that. A hearing aid will amplify all, all voices. But, but by using the latest artificial intelligence, uh, I can focus only on our discussion and filter out everyone else. So this would be a very, very huge value to people with hearing disabilities. Now, unlike visual disabilities, everyone will be hearing disabled with age. Right? You may have good sight even when you are very, very old, but when you are very old, nobody has good hearing. So hearing disability is something that is, is a very, very big problem uh, to solve because it affects the entire society. So this is the next uh, level of uh, Orcom's focus. Là, là, il s'agit de personnes qui ont un handicap, mais vous l'avez dit, ça peut aider les personnes à avoir une meilleure vue, à voir des choses qu'elles ne pourraient pas voir, par exemple, la nuit. Euh, Est-ce que c'est le but aussi Qu'est-ce que vous pensez, en fait, de ce qu'on appelle les personnes augmentées, euh, des humains améliorés grâce à la technologie Oui, je ne suis pas très focus sur les you know, uh, biology, biological implants ou être capable de améliorer certains processus uh, I think empowering people comes from a different perspective. Empowering people is, can be done by the recent wave of artificial intelligence, especially when you're looking at you know, the progress of the last few years in language, in language models. This has huge, uh, huge potential in creating, in taking the computer, which today is a tool, I, I open my computer, I do search, I do PowerPoint, it's a tool for me. And creating from it a partner, a thought partner. So it could enhance my creativity. It could answer my questions, not search, answer my questions. Uh, it could guide me, say I'm a researcher and I'm looking at a new field, it could guide my, my, uh, uh, my research. Say I'm a writer, it could give me ideas or I can put my raw ideas and the computer can write the full, the full book, the full uh, document. It can help me process data. Say, say I have 10 different articles in a particular, uh, particular topic and I would like the computer to summarize the entire topic. Write me now one article which summarizes those 10 articles. Or 
summarize a particular article in a way that I can read it much, uh, much faster. Or now I can do a question and answering. Say I, 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 I plug in 100 different articles on, on, a, on a topic. Uh, say I now want to study FinTech. I do a Google search, I find 100 uh, articles, I plug them into the AI, and then I want the AI not only to summarize, but to answer questions. I ask questions, the AI has those 100 articles and also word knowledge and answers my questions. So now the computer becomes a partner. Not, it's not a tool. And, and this is something that is just around the corner. It's not futuristic. So five years ago, it would be futuristic. Now, it's around the corner. When you see all those new language models that are being uh, released, the latest one, ChatGPT, but you know, all those, they, they're not yet products. They have all sorts of weaknesses, but you see the potential. Mais d'ailleurs, je me posais la question, ChatGPT, euh, vous l'avez testé c'est vraiment en effet un outil formidable. Est-ce que vous n'êtes pas un peu déçu de ne pas l'avoir lancé vous, puisque vous avez votre entreprise dans ce domaine-là, sur les plateformes de langage, AI21 euh, Est-ce que euh, OpenAI aux États-Unis, ça ne vous a pas un peu coupé l'herbe euh, sous le pied avec euh, cette, euh, cette technologie First, it's amazing. Amazing, amazing. But when you, when you go deeper, you see it's not yet at the product level. You know, there's issues of uh, factuality. The big issues of language models is factuality. How do you know that what has been generated is correct or not correct? Second is explainability. How did you get to your answer? Right? When you ask a human, ask a question and you get an answer, you can ask also the human, how did you get to that answer? What was your sources of information to get to the answer? What was your kind of uh, 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 inductive or deductive processes in your brain, in your mind, to get to that answer. You cannot ask an AI to explain the answer, right? It's kind of an end-to-end -end black, uh, black box. Uh, transparency, toxicity. There's all sorts of things that are missing today in these, uh, in, in these language models to make them a product. But still, it's amazing. What AI21 is focused on, it's focused on very similar things, but from a product perspective. Uh, so it's kind of a product-oriented thinking, but using the same principles. So AI21 also built a GPT-3 type of engine called uh, Jurassic, same size. Uh, but now we are working on the factuality, we are working on the explainability. Uh, we created a number of tools that are today a product, they are called the uh, Wordtune. And today Wordtune has about 5 million uh, users. So Wordtune allows you to write much more uh, easier. Uh, we started with you write your text, and then you highlight a sentence or a paragraph, and it will, it will suggest rephrasing. Today, you can start, you write a text, and then you put a plus, and then it will give you suggestions. For example, you can select, add a statistical fact to what I have written. You can take, add a humoristic note to what I have written. Now, continue another paragraph of what I have written and so forth and so forth. So it kind of accelerates, it also improves and accelerates your writing uh, process, but at the level of a product. Not at the level of a demonstration, but at the level of a product. Now AI21 also has, has a reading tool. You can plug in a, uh, a article and ask it to summarize it to you. Ask it to tell you what are the 10 big ideas of this uh, article and so forth and so forth. So taking this AI and creating a product uh, kind of uh, thinking of it. L'intelligence artificielle, elle transforme en, en profondeur en fait tous les domaines de la société, les transports, euh, la santé, euh, l'industrie, la finance. Mais dans quel secteur vous pensez qu'elle aura le plus d'impact à l'avenir So why don't just separate AI? There is AI in the real world and there is AI in the digital world. <coughs> Most of the AI that we know about today is in the digital world. There's very few AI in the real world. There are two places where AI is in the real world. One is cars, autonomy. That's huge AI, making cars drive themselves. This, I think, will make a huge impact on society, on transportation, on, on how you design cities. You don't need all those huge parking lots. So this is, this is already happening. The next place where AI in the real world will come is robotics. I believe that in five years uh, from now, you can have a robot in your house 
goes on two legs, bipedal, that can do 90% of the chores in the house. It can, you know, vacate a table. It can, you know, uh, put the dishes in the dishwasher and, and, you know, take out the dishes from the dishwasher. It can do your laundry. You can teach it to do things like, you know, prepare me a cup of espresso and so forth. You can talk to it. Five years from now, AI in robotics. But the biggest impact is AI in the digital world. And this is where companies like AI21, OpenAI, you know, Google Brain, uh, DeepMind, um, AI in the real world that would transform a computer from a tool to a thought uh, partner. This will change everything in terms of how we interact with computers, uh, how, we, how we do creativity, how do we do creative work. The computer can help us in doing creative work. Even today, you look at DAL E2 and you know the, the similar engines, you know, you could start creating paintings. Right? And, and you can use this as a starting point of creating art. Right? So computer is, that's going to be the biggest impact in the near term of how people interact with computers through AI. Vous avez également créé une banque digitale, One Zero, capable de détecter les fraudes hein, euh, et d'identifier précisément les clients. Et ce système, il a été adopté par d'autres grandes entreprises, je pense à PayPal ou, ou euh, encore Google. Mais à part ça, qu'est-ce qu'elle a de particulier, euh, votre banque So, uh, One Zero, on one hand, you know, it's a full digital bank. So, it's, it's kind of a neo bank. It's the first bank in Israel since 40 years, which is very important uh, from the Israeli perspective. Uh, the message of it, beside the fact that it's a full service digital bank, is that it has significant artificial intelligence to allow the system to manage your account without a human touch. So people, what we found out that people are not interested in financial education. You can teach people how to manage their account, but people are not interested in it. They simply want it to be done. And they want to trust someone who will manage their account for them. So if you are high net worth, high network worth say you're a rich person, you're a wealthy person, then you have a family officer. Your family officer manages your account, decides where to invest, and makes sure that everything is always set. But what, 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 what about the rest of society? Um, not everyone can have a family officer. The idea is to replace family officers with artificial intelligence. The, the AI understands everything, all your, all your services, all your uh, activities, financial activities, and starts giving you recommendations and also actions of what to do with your money in order to optimize, in order to make sure that your, your account is managed just like a family officer would manage your account and do it at scale. This is kind of the message of uh, One Zero. We're starting with Israel. Today we have about 40,000 uh, accounts and growing. Um, 2023, we're about to expand to Europe with the uh, partners and take the, the, the basic AI engine and build uh, new digital banks in Europe or partner with existing uh, banks in, in Europe and take that promise also outside of uh, Israel. That's, that's where the one zero is going. Les pronostics sont de plus en plus inquiétants à court terme sur le réchauffement climatique. Quand est-ce que vous allez lancer une entreprise pour l'écologie? So in terms of ecology, instead of business, we are now building a, a, a branch of our uh, philanthropy in, 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 uh, to look at, uh, at climate. So we started focusing first on in, in, in Israel try to find, we, we, we partnered uh, with, uh, with a group, it's called uh, Adam Teva Vadin, I don't know how you translate this to, uh, to, to English, in which they're coming up with ideas that do not contradict economic uh, growth to help regulators and, and government uh, officials in, in kind of making decisions that on one hand will not contradict economic growth, but will be good for the climate. So, and if we succeed here in Israel, we'll start replicating this outside of, uh, outside of Israel. 
vous avez développé toutes vos entreprises dans l'écosystème israélien, donc vous devez penser qu'il est favorable à l'innovation. Mais quel est, selon vous, le secret de cette start-up nation You know, the, the, the Israeli engineer, and, and this is something that, you know, people have written books about it, like, you know, the Israel startup nation and so forth. You know, they, they, they reach the employment age with a lot, a lot of maturity, a lot of experience coming from the army, the responsibility they get in the army, also the culture, uh, the Israeli uh, culture of, um, you know, being very, very savvy. You know, people are not satisfied just with survival. People want to prosper. People want to kind of succeed against all, all odds, uh, which is very, very, you know, part of the, part of the culture. And, and, and this creates a, a, a super engineer. Now, if you manage them uh, correctly, you can get from the Israeli engineer, you can get kind of a multiplication factor that would be difficult to get outside of, uh, outside of Israel. So uh, I, I find the focus on the Israeli engineer as uh, something very valuable, but you know, mobilize a global company. You know, we, have, we have branches in Japan, in the US, of course, and uh, in, in Europe, it's a global company. Vous êtes professeur à l'Université hébraïque de Jérusalem. Uh, Est-ce que vous, vous enseignez uh, toujours? Yeah, so I have, I have a group of uh, students. Yeah. I'm very active in, in research. Yeah. Um, I have a number of PhD students and master students, and um, you know, I meet them uh, once a week, and we publish uh, papers. Et, et qu'est-ce que vous dites à euh, vos étudiants quand ils vous demandent quel est le secret d'un bon entrepreneur With my students, the focus is how to become a professor. So when I, when I have a PhD student, what the PhD student is looking for is not to finish his studies and go outside uh, to, uh, uh, to work in the industry, is how to excel and go to a good postdoc and how to excel, excel there and become a faculty, faculty member. And I have quite a, a large number of students who today are professors. I have three of them in Tel Aviv University, uh, one at the Technion, one in Beersheva. And this gives me a lot of pride, being able to educate a, a new generation of students that become faculty, faculty members. So my focus in academia is to train people to stay in academia and not go outside into industry. Mais euh, tout de même, j'aimerais vraiment savoir, selon vous, que, quelles sont vraiment les clés pour être un bon entrepreneur It's hard to uh, find the recipe of... Uh, sometimes it's in you. Um, no, the, the, you have to have curiosity. You have to have... Um, you have to be not satisfied ever with what you have. Right? You always want to, to continue, you always want to improve. Um, You want, you have this desire to build something big, to make an impact. There are all sorts of things that make, make an entrepreneur out of you. And sometimes yeah, it's not made, it's born. It's, it's very difficult to come up with, uh, <laughs> with kind of a recipe. How do you become an entrepreneur? Et si on vous demandait quelle a été votre plus grande erreur en tant qu'entrepreneur? I, I, I don't think I made big mistakes. <laughs> so I, I think I'm, I'm more lucky than, uh, than others. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to kind of identify big mistakes. I, I think, you know, once I read about the Roman Empire, yeah. you know, why, what was their secret of success that they lasted for so long? Yeah. You know, more than 400 years. Um, and, and the kind of the, the, the secret of their success was they, they were able to identify small problems before they became big problems. And when the problem is small, it's easy to, to solve. If you ignore it and let the problem grow and grow and grow, then it becomes difficult to, uh, to solve. And I think this is also true as, as an entrepreneur. You have, to always be, you have to always be aware of what's going wrong when it's only starting. And then it's easy to solve. If you start ignoring and, and waiting until this problem becomes big, then it becomes a big mistake. And I think I'm lucky to be able to see the problems when they're small and solve them and not wait until they are big. Quelle est la personne qui vous a le plus inspiré I had uh, two, uh, two mentors. First, uh, and both of them are alive today and doing well. First mentor was my uh, master and uh, PhD advisor, Shimon Ullman. Uh, he's at the Weizmann Institute and he is also an entrepreneur. He was an entrepreneur as well. So kind of the inspiration of being able to be both an entrepreneur and an academic came from observing Shimon Ullman. 
My next mentor was at MIT, Tommy Poggio, Tommaso uh, Poggio, uh, professor at the Brain Cognitive Science uh, Department. And this is where I really became an entrepreneur. During my, my, my PhD, we had a number of projects together, me and then Tommaso Poggio. And this gave me kind of the confidence that I can be an entrepreneur and an academic uh, together. Um, so both of them are my mentors and the people that I look up to. L'invention la plus marquante de ces 30 dernières années pour vous? I, I, I would say the biggest impact on, on, human, on human life came from computers. You know, back in the 60s, 70s, you know, people did not think that computers is something that's going to make an impact on, on people. Computers were used to, uh, you know, to, uh, to do, you know, financial calculations in, in, in terms of, you know, in enterprises, uh, but not something that will start affecting human life. And then, then there were a number of revolutions, and people are not aware of these revolutions. The first revolution was, you know, the PC, the personal computer back in the, back in the 80s. All of a sudden, there are no mainframes. Everyone has, has a computer. Second revolution was the internet. All of a sudden, people are connected. Next revolution was the smartphone. The, the computer is now in, in your hand. Uh, next revolution was the, the social networks. I don't think it's a good revolution, but it was a revolution, right? <laughs> social networks. And then the internet of things. Now the next revolution is AI. So when you think of what has made the biggest impact on society in the past 50 years, it's compute. And it's going to continue making the impact on society. Et quelle serait l'invention la plus importante pour vous dans les 10 prochaines années? Artificial intelligence. Why artificial intelligence? Because if a computer can have the intelligence to solve problems, because you know, humans are conscious and intelligence. It comes together. Computers don't need to be conscious. They can be intelligent. Intelligence is the ability to solve problems, problem solving. If in 10 years from now, AI can be at the level of problem solving, which can exceed human capability of problem solving, then the biggest problems that society has, whether it's climate change, whether it's energy and so forth, can be solved by computers. And this will also you know, change society. Right? So artificial intelligence, if you look at it today, has the potential in 10 years from now to be a problem solver better than humans. And if it's a problem solver better than humans, then you can start asking computers about helping solving the biggest problem of society, which is around energy and climate change. Merci beaucoup, Amnon Shahashua, d'avoir été avec nous sur I24 News. Thank you.